Well, it's good to see everybody. Everybody good today? Yes. You like this cooler weather? Yes. You get your little vital, or what do they call it? Vibrant? or No, not vibrant. I don't know. It makes you feel alive, though, doesn't it? You yes. suck in a lot of that cold air when you get out there loading up stuff. We're getting ready to go to, to Henderson, Nevada, which is a suburb of Vegas. And so we were trying to load and get things together, and wow. It's like, here we go again. So I <laughs> loading all this stuff. So, so well, first off, I'm going to pray. Father, we just thank you that we can gather under the name of your son, Jesus, and that your word is true. And Father, we thank you for your presence, for your spirit always being with us. Father, we thank you for what's going to come forth today, that we believe it is by your spirit. Father, I thank you that even now you've prepared hearts, you've, you've got the people watching that need to be watching, the people that are here that need to be here. So Father, we thank you for it. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, well, we got some real quick announcements. First off, DBI will be starting January of next year and go January, February, March. So that's our Bible school. So if you're interested, be sure to let us know and we'll try to get you plugged into that. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> also, of course, our healing rooms are open uh, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, if, if you, a lot of times I'm traveling, as I will be this week. So if you need to come, you can still come. There are people here that can pray and get the job done. So, or if you know somebody you need to bring them over, feel free to bring them over. Uh, if you can, call first. Matter of fact, Kevin, would you write down the phone number and get that to me? Thank you. We have phones here now. We are moving up in the world. We, have, we, have <laughs> we don't have to send by smoke signals or anything else anymore. We actually have telephones now. So. But uh, we can give you a number that you can call here directly. Also, if you're coming from out of town, of course, you should always call ahead. You don't necessarily need an appointment, but it's good if we know you're coming. Uh, it doesn't have to be a set specific time, but it's good that we can cut people free to uh, be able to minister. Because everybody, if you're here, you're working. So we, if you're going to come in for prayer, we need to know. <clears throat> um, we talked last week about the church and about being members of the church. And we had, I think, something like, I believe it was right at 20 new members last week. Thank you, sir. And so we want to welcome all of our new members. And membership is open here. It's just basically saying you want to fellowship with us and you're committed here and you're helping and kind of know, want to know what to do. So we'll get more details of that. With these, All these will be on our website. Plus we'll have them on a brochure that we're going to be handing out. Uh, a lot of that's still in the works. Should be done, I would assume, by next week. <clears throat> so we will be uh, talking a little bit more about that. I don't know if you've heard this morning so far, or actually it was last night, a 7.7 .7 earthquake hit British Columbia, uh, out just off the coast. Uh, what, it, what it did, I'm not sure how much damage was done in Canada, but I do know that they issued tsunami warning, warnings for Hawaii, and a five-foot wave did hit there. No damage was done. The people were, the beaches were closed and all that, so it's, it was pretty good. And I think they have lowered that now to an advisory, and they're not expecting anything else. After the 7.7, .7, there was a 5.8 also that hit. So there were some uh, things going on there. So we want to make sure that we do remember to be praying for them and for those that were uh, affected by that. So it's always good to know what is going on. Plus, we have a storm coming up on the East Coast that uh, they got some very dire predictions for and talking about it becoming a nor'easter, as they would call it. So we're going to be praying against that uh, over the next couple of days. So we invite everyone to join with us and uh, commanding that thing to die and not to be doing any damage. So we will be doing that. Uh, those of you that are members of the church, you will be getting some prayer directives from us. And we'll be talking about these things because we want to, what we're trying to do is get everybody's email so that whenever something like this comes up, we can just shoot you an email and, and we'll even have in there how we're going to pray, what we're going to be doing, and that way you'll have an idea of uh, how, to, how, to, how to join with us so we can also have the prayer of agreement working with us. So. Um, now, the phone number here is 469-209-0946. So, that's pretty much all the same numbers over and over again. 469-209-0946. That's here at the offices. So, uh, if you call during regular hours, there'll be somebody that can answer that phone. Now, also... There is a lot going on. Obviously, we had the election coming up. I think they said it was nine days away. So we are in prayer about that. We need to be, the Bible says, to pray for those that are in authority. 
and we're going to be praying for that. It says to pray for leaders. So we are to pray for righteous people to rule. And if we, if the righteous rule, then the people can live in peace. If the righteous do not rule, if the wicked rule, then the people do not live in peace. So we need to pray that the righteous rule. Now, <clears throat> so there, there's a lot of other details I go into. As I have told you before, we get a lot of uh, emails from people in the military about things that are going on and different things. So at times, I will be talking about those. I'm not going to talk about them today because we're gathering some stuff and I'm doing some checking. But there have been some really, um, I would call them disturbing reports coming in from the military to us, uh, talking about some things that are going on in the military and some of the different directives or orders that they're being given. And so we will bring those out at, at a future date once I, have, once I have confirmed them and talk with the people and making sure that I'm not putting out something that is Ill illegal to put out. In other words, I don't want to get any of our soldiers in trouble because I repeat something they gave to me. So, uh, there's a, but there is some amazing, if amazing is the right word to use, there are some things going on that uh, we definitely need to be praying against. So, we'll keep you in touch with all that. Uh, and, you know, years ago, first, one of the first times I went over to Africa, first time I guess, I was picked up at the airport. I, I went over, I had no one there, I had no real, no real contacts uh, at the, in Nairobi when I went in. Yeah, I went into Kenya. And there was a taxi that picked me up at the airport and went about two, they loaded all my stuff up and they went about two blocks and they had an address where they were supposed to take me when they went about two blocks, they stopped. Another guy got in the front seat next to the, the driver, which I thought was kind of strange, but my first time in Africa, I thought, okay, maybe it's just a little different culture. Kind of find out it wasn't. It was a plan to rob me and either leave me or kill me or do something, but that was their plan. And uh, at one point when I understood what they were saying, then I began telling them that if I was to disappear or if anything was to, if they were to do anything to me, that the, my president would drop a bomb on top of them that's what I told him. He might may or disagree with that or agree with it. That's what I told him. <laughs> okay. So, uh, at which time, shortly after that, they pulled over, jumped out, and grabbed all my luggage, threw it out. When I got out to see what they were doing, then they jumped back in the car and took off. So, basically left me not stranded, but not in a convenient place. Um, but, now I was pretty certain at that point that I, I was not on the government's uh, radar in the sense that if something did happen to me that they would actually drop a bomb, okay? But I didn't know if, the, if these guys knew that for sure or not, so uh, it was uh, apparently it had its, the good effect that I was trying for. And so, um, but, but the fact is when I was in the military I did have the um, assurance that if something happened to me or something was a situation that my government would back me up and come after me or find me or that at least if that wasn't the case that the people I was there with would find me. Um, I was pretty certain that everybody wouldn't wait until the dust settled to figure out whether to come help me or not. So I have a real problem with that. But the um, reason I'm saying that is because right now our military needs prayer and based on not just the orders are being given but the military personnel themselves need some serious prayer. They need help, they need backup, they need to know that if anything happens they're going to be taken care of. About that situation for at least about the last month on purpose after I started getting some, some uh, emails and things. And, and hopefully I'll be able to talk more about this a little bit later on, but I just want you to know, begin praying that the direction that I'm praying is that our military will be taken care of, that they'll do the right thing, they'll be told to do the right thing, and that they can follow the orders and that they will not follow illegal orders. And so that's just kind of the direction that, that I've been praying. So um, a, a lot of this has to do with really the mindset of the military at this point. So there is a lot of push back and forth. Uh, part of it's because of this election, but part of it is just the, the way it normally is just heightened. It's like everybody's on edge. Everybody's, I don't want to say nervous, but it's like everybody's on edge. So, a lot of things going on. So, be in prayer with that. Uh, the, the scriptures tell us to pray, and it gives us a list. So, if you, people say, well, you know, I just don't, I can't pray for an hour. You can pray for an hour just for our leaders. So, start going through the list. You know, get a list together and start going through. We'll be doing this in the future. I'll show you how to do it. But today, when I was um, 
actually a couple days ago when I shared and said, okay, God, what do you want me to bring out this Sunday? <clears throat> this started coming. And at first, I kept trying to go another direction. You know, you can kind of have an idea in your mind of, okay, I want to cover this. And then God says, yeah, that's good, but go here. You know, yeah, but that's got nothing to do with that. Yeah, I know, just do what I tell you. It kind of goes that way a lot of times. So I um, eventually just kind of gave in and said, okay, we'll do it your way. And so today, this is a little bit different for me because I'm not used to... Um, some of the teaching will be kind of, I don't want to say standard, but uh, standard for us, put it that way. But I wanted to give you the idea this morning uh, that there, the church, there's, there's two major branches of the church. Yeah, we can break this in all kinds of ways. But the two major branches, one is one exalts uh, secular education and the other doesn't believe. God gave us a brain. He expects us to use it. He gave us knowledge. He gave us, he told us to renew our mind. So we are responsible. Now God recreated our spirit, but he told us to renew our mind to the word of God. Now, so I'm just going to hit some things today. And like I said, this is really strange for me. I've never done it this way. So I'm really, I'm, I'm curious to see how it turns out. <laughs> so um, it's like we say, if, if you don't like it, tell us. If you do like it, tell others. You know, that's kind of the standard thing. But I want you to think about this. I, Paul several times talked about not being ignorant. And he talked about knowing this. Don't be ignorant about this. Know this. So he said it over and over again. So we're going to look at that some today. But I want you to first think back. Obviously, the way we see the church today is not the way it was in the book of Acts. It, not that the book of Acts was exactly right all the way because there was a lot of problems. But I'm just saying the way, the system of the church today is quite different from even how church was done in the early church. And we all know that. Now, admitted there are varying degrees of how far the church has gone away from the original plan. We could say that even this wasn't technically the original plan, but as far as culture and lifestyles today, this is one of the best ways to do church, if you want to, if you want to say it that way. Uh, obviously, we do home churches, we do home fellowships, which are always good, and that's where you get a lot of the fellowship and you get a lot of the closeness. Um, but as far as being able to reach the mass of people, this system is about the best we have at this point. Now, we're using internet even now to broadcast. We're using CDs and DVDs and we record, and so we're sending this out. We're using every major form or every form basically of mass communication that we that we have access to at this point and so we're doing all we can there and even though this may not always be the best system it's the best we have at this point so you work with what you've got and then you develop and you basically get you know find out the best way to do it but if we were almost 2,000 years ago we would be sitting in someone's house possibly now, that's if the persecution wasn't going on. If the persecution was going on, we might be hiding in the catacombs. Or we might be hiding in caves. Or we might be, you know, hiding somewhere else. Or meeting in private. Or meeting in, in uh, secret, we might say. Much like the church in China does today. They have to meet what they call the underground church. And have to meet in homes. And it's very private. It's very secret. So I want us to just, you know, I, I, we're not going to dim the lights and make this look like a cave or anything. But I want you to just think back. Let's put ourselves back to about maybe 75, 80 AD, somewhere between 60 and 90 AD. Okay? Now, what that means is at this point, we have pretty much all the letters of the New Testament except possibly the book of the Revelation. Uh, maybe 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, maybe those aren't quite out yet. But we have a, uh, the large majority of the epistles. But now let's think back, because you have to realize what we, look, what we see today isn't what they saw then. Obviously, it was a big difference. In the beginning, there were the 12 apostles, or most of the church never even knew the 12. Most of the church, by the time of the book of Acts, they only knew the 11. And then the 12th coming in, and Matthias was put in. So when they talked about the apostles, already they had one that technically hadn't traveled with Jesus as an apostle, hadn't been sent out as an apostle. Now, it is very possible that Matthias was one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. So there is some, some uh, record that, that he very possibly could have been that. So maybe he actually saw Jesus, which would make sense based on how they, 
that decided who should pick up Judas's place. But let's think back into that time. Let's put ourselves back there and let's start thinking in terms of, okay, we're here, we gathered up. Church wasn't a system. It wasn't about religion. It, 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 you know, in the sense of religion or a system, and you look, I mean, basically the only, well, there were a lot of religions out at that time, a lot of them. And throughout the Roman Empire, Rome always allowed freedom of religion to a large degree, unless they thought it was a threat against the empire. Then they would try to squash it. Or if they had a friend in the empire that didn't like it. That's why many times the Romans would come down upon the Christians because the Jewish religion at that time said, this is a threat, we don't like it, and if you want us to be friends with you, you've got to end this little sect called the Christians. And so there was a lot of controversy there. But all the other religions were accepted. All the other religions were pretty well um, left alone. You know, whatever God you wanted to serve, that was okay. It was pretty much they didn't care. Rome was more political than it was theological, even though there was emperor worship at that time where they said the emperor is a god and you've got to stick him in there with the other gods. So there was all this kind of turmoil but yet at the same time it was on a level where there wasn't uh, heavy persecution except at times. Now, so <clears throat> think about it in the sense of okay this is a time where there, maybe there's not persecution going on right now. We can gather together in some, some form of freedom and yet uh, it, we don't have the Bible. The Bible is non-existent at this point. Matter of fact, the closest thing we do have are the scrolls of the Old Testament. And so, we, you know, even the letters written by the apostles wasn't scripture yet. It was important. It was directives. It was um, in a sense that we would listen to it, but it was direction. And so from time to time, let's say wherever we are at this point, we have letters or we hear about these letters being passed around to churches. But, you know, they were really... Um, Paul only wrote 13 to 14 letters, depending on how you count them. And you think about that, and then you look at Peter, write just a couple of letters. You look at James, you look at all the different ones. All together, you know, there, there's not that many letters that would have been passed around. They would have had the Gospels started to come out, telling stories about Jesus and, and understanding his life. But as a whole, unless you were a, for some reason, were on the map, you didn't get a letter. Paul didn't sit down basically and write letters to everybody, to every church. Now, he wrote, wrote letters to the churches he went to and that he founded, but a lot of those letters were expected to be passed around. So a letter would come to one church and they'd read it or they'd make a copy of it and write it out and then they would pass it on to, to the, another church. Somebody traveling would take it, hey, you're going to so-and-so, okay, take this with you, would you? And you, they would take it with you. And so they would pass these letters around, but it wasn't anything like we have today. It was so scattered. It was so different. Uh, there was no... The closest thing we had to a central authority would have been the apostles in Jerusalem at that point. And even while the church was scattered, a lot of the... A lot, in the beginning, the apostles stayed put. And so most of the gospel was spread not by the apostles. It was spread by believers who were in their daily business, traveled from one city to another because of trade or commerce of some sort, or whenever persecution started, many times it was because they were so persecuted they actually had to, to leave and go to another area, which the persecution actually helped spread the gospel. So, and we read about that later in Paul's letter. If you assume that Paul wrote Hebrews, he talks about how they wandered about, how they were in caves, how they were destitute, and what they went through. I mean, you can imagine what they were thinking. If, they, if we had lived at that time, we'd be thinking probably what they did, which was, wow, this must be it. This must be, this must be the tribulation Jesus talked about. This must be the thing. So you start looking, and I'm not taking a, a position on end times or anything else. Somebody says, well, you know, what is your position on the end times? Yep, I believe we're in them. Simple as that. I believe they started 2,000 years ago because Peter said, this is what Joel said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit. So as far as I'm concerned, the day of Pentecost started the last days. And the last days have lasted 2,000 years. So when you start looking at this, put yourself there. And, and this is how I read the Bible most of the time is I, I try to put myself in the situation. Maybe as a bystander. I'm standing there watching it go on, but I put myself there. So just put yourself there. We're here. We're in a, a little town off on the side of the road. Maybe a commerce area is going through there. You know, the trade routes were coming through there. And we would hear news. We're in the Roman Empire. 
Every so often you'd have a Roman legion march through and you'd have, uh, there would be uh, the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, which is basically the Romans ruled and if you cause trouble, they'd just kill you. Pretty simple. And so picture us on this trade route and we're, we're in this little town. The town doesn't mean much. It's not a famous town. It's not a big town. It's just, it just happens to be maybe a stopover for the night on the trade route where people stop and as they're going to, to market. So here we are, approximately 80 AD, something like that, and we're a group of believers that are gathered together for whatever reason, and, and very honestly, in most towns at that time, this would have been a huge church, huge church, because most churches were in the, in the homes, and you would have the families, but it would, you would usually, even according to Jewish tradition, whenever you got 12 families together, then you built a synagogue. And so it was always built toward that. So a church like this, this would have been a huge local Christian fellowship because the Christians were looked at as a cult. And they were looked at as an offshoot of Judaism at that point until the, the final break was really made. Well, <clears throat> picture that. We're gathered up and we come together on the Lord's Day. And as we come together, you, we don't come in, you don't bring in Bibles. Yeah, most of you wouldn't have had even things to write on or write with. You would have just came to, to hear what you could. There would have been some teaching. The teaching would have probably not lasted that long unless you had a, somebody like Paul that was coming through that happened to stay over the night, and then we know how he did. He preached deep into the night many times because he had a lot to say. But picture if you had just a local church, and more than likely as being a pastor of a local church at that time, I would have been, uh, I would have had a trade, you know, a typical trade, uh, doing something in the city, doing something normally during the week. But at the same time, at that point, there would not have been what we would consider as an office of a pastor where that's all they did. And they, they would have worked with their hands. They would have built tents like, like Paul did at times or built different things. And they would, have had, they would have had a trade where they made their living. And yet, at the same time, they would have had a calling. They would have been a Christian. Usually, the first Christian in town ended up becoming the pastor. Why? Because he was the most mature. And at that time, they would have called him an elder. And so he would have been learning. And as news came in, they would have came in to find who was a man of peace in that town, which would have been that person. And that's where the news would have been disseminated from. They would have come in and said, here's, here's, here's the news. So whenever you had a visitor come through, you say, what's, what's the news in the empire? What's going on? Uh, you know, with the apostles, where are they at? Well, you heard, you know, Paul got arrested. No, when did that happen? Well, about two weeks ago. Well, what are they going to do? Well, we're not sure yet. You know, he's appealed to Caesar, so, you know, it's still in air, so be praised. So I, I just want you to get that mindset of what it would be like to live then. It wouldn't have been this. It wouldn't have been where your alarm clock goes off and you go and get in your car and you come here and you, you know, you have an idea of when it's going to start and when it's going to stop. It wasn't like that. You know, it was much more, it, it was like a big family. And this, this wouldn't have been the only time you saw each other during the week. You probably, because the small area, we probably would have been, probably had shops next door to each other, talk to each other. And while we're sitting there and there's no customers buying our goods, we had been discussing the fellowship last week. We'd have been discussing the message that came out. We'd have been discussing, wow, did you hear that, that, that tongues and interpretation? I've never heard anything like that. That was amazing. Because you know him. You know he doesn't know, you know, this form of, of this, this language. And yet God spoke to him. You'd be disgusted. This would be big news to you. That God could actually speak in another language through someone. So you got this idea of, what well, this would all be so brand new. Remember back when you first got saved, how everything was just so dramatic. Everything was big. And, and you got so excited. And you got around older Christians. And they're like, well, you'll calm down. You know, and it's like, yeah, I can see your fire just dying. You know, but that's the way they were right then because it was all new. And honestly, by that time they would have had some letters, but the letters wouldn't have been put together. They would have come in piecemeal. So just kind of put yourself back there whenever we come in here together. Your first question wouldn't have been, well, you know, I wonder what the message is going to be like or how long is the message going to be because, you know, I left something on the stove and I want to make sure I'm back home before it burns. You know, I left something in the crock pot. You wouldn't have thought that way. It would have been, uh, you know, not only it, what, what's the message going to be about. It would have been more along the lines of what's the news? Well, what's going on throughout the rest of the empire? How the, you know, is the persecution coming here? Because we heard persecution. 
persecution starting, how bad is it going to be? Is it going to be local? Is it going to be just in Jerusalem? Or is it going to reach us? What are we going to do? And so that mindset would have been together. So when you come together, you'd have been gathered up and been talking even before you kind of got and said, okay, hey, let's, uh, let's get started. Even before that, there would have been this discussion, you know, or well, have you heard of anything? Have you heard what's going on? And there would have been this, this, the real thing would not have been the message, it would have been the news. So it would have been, what are, we, what are we going to find out? So today, what I want to do is, I want you to think in terms of that's us. We've gotten together, you don't know the Bible, you've not read through it, all you know is that from time to time you get a letter, you get something, and, and the letters, and the bad part is, the letters aren't even written to you. They're written to the church 300 miles away that somebody come through, is take, they were told to take it to that other church, and all along the way they stopped, and it was because they spent the night, they said, oh yeah, I'm carrying a letter from, from Peter. Really, what does it say? Well, it's to the church there, but here, I'll read it to you. Because he said, let it be read to the churches, and Paul said the same thing to his. So, let's just read what it, what it says. And here's what's going on in that church, and Peter was answering the problems, or Paul was answering the problems. So, you would listen in. More or less. But it wasn't written to you and delivered to you. It wouldn't have been a, you wouldn't have taken it as a, thus saith the Lord to you. Why? Because it was a letter that you just eavesdropped on. And so, picture yourself there. So we gather up. Now, we don't have a letter to ourselves. So I can't just come to you and just read a letter to you other than letters that were supposed to be passed around. But let's just take some pieces. And, and so, I want us to think in terms of, let's say we travel. Let's say half of the people in this room traveled. Uh, on your daily business and you had to go to this town or maybe maybe there's several towns and outlying towns and your business meant you had to go around to each one during the week and as you went around you would meet with the Christians why because they would draw the little thing in the dirt and then you would notice and you would draw the other half of the fish symbol and that's how you knew you were a Christian and you say yeah can I talk to you yeah well what have you heard well you know we got this well have you heard anything well I got this you know the, I got this part of a letter uh, they were telling me about it and when I read the letter when when uh, Timothy came through carrying a letter from Paul. I, I, I got the chance to read it, and he let me read it, so I, I wrote down some, some pieces that stood out to me. So let me share some of those things, because this is directives from Paul. And so I just want to kind of get you in that mindset. So, and then if you were going to talk about it, you say, you know, uh, for instance, and this is what we are talking about in the beginning, don't be ignorant. <coughs> be sober. Don't be ignorant. Be sober. We're going to look at, at kind of these things. And, and it may not... It may, this may not be going the way you think it's going to go, just by the title, right? Because the first thing in the first century church, guess what? Their messages didn't have titles. Why? Because they were not topical. And generally, when you got a letter, you read the whole letter. You didn't go in the letter and pick out bits and pieces here and, and this kind of thing and try to fit it all together. Usually that's where wrong teaching comes from, is when you start picking and choosing. But when you read expositionally, then you get the whole idea of what was being said. That's why I always tell you, read everything. Read every word. Go into it. Check out every word. But today I want us to think back like you were in that first century church and like we don't have all these letters and we can't just pick up the Bible or pick up a computer and look up a word and all of a sudden you've got, you know, this word is used 325 times and then it takes you through every one of them. We don't have that. What we have is a few snippets. We come together and you say, well, I read this. And I remember Paul said, well, you know, Paul said not to be ignorant. Oh, I remember Paul said not to be ignorant about this. Does anybody remember anything else Paul said not to be ignorant about? Well, I remember him saying not to be ignorant about this thing. You see, we would start kind of pulling together ideas of what Paul was saying, don't be ignorant. And then you start realizing, you know, Paul said that to a lot of people. He said it to a lot of different groups. Almost every church he wrote to, he said, don't be ignorant. And it, many times he'd say, be wise. And he almost always put them together. Or, don't be ignorant, be sober. Be sober-minded. So let's just look at some of Did we get these little snippets? I want to just bring these out. Romans 1.13. Now again, that wouldn't be something you would have heard in the first century church. Because it didn't have chapters and it didn't have verses. So you just had to be able to say what they said. And so, if you want to look it up, I'll give you these scriptures. But Romans 1.13... Paul, writing to the church in Rome, tells the Roman believers, a group just like us, he tells them, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Now notice he's talking, he says two brethren, so we know he's talking to. But I would not have you ignorant, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, or was hindered, is the way they would say it. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. 
He said, I, Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know. Don't, don't think I don't care about you just because I haven't showed up there. Paul is saying, I, want you to, I, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know that I have tried to get there, but I've been hindered. So now notice, things didn't always go the way Paul wanted them to go. Many times he was trying to go one place and God would give him a dream or something. He'd go somewhere else. Or he was trying to go somewhere and he couldn't get there. And you know that would be pretty frustrating. I, I know how frustrating that can be at times when you're either trying to get to a physical geographical place and you can't get there for whatever reason. Or if you're trying to get the church someplace and can't quite get it there. You know, and you have to keep going back and not starting over again, but just laying the foundation. Because the worst thing you can do is get a group built up to a certain place without that foundation because then they're real shaky. And the idea is that you have to build that foundation into them. So he says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know I want to come to you. I've tried to come to you. I've purposed in my heart to come to you. My heart is with you. I want to be there. Then later on in the same letter, which was a pretty good sized letter, in what we call Romans 11, chapter 11, in verse 25, he says, he tells them again, same letter to the same people. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, li now listen carefully, because when he referred to the mystery, he's almost always talking about the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the mystery of this new creation, Christ in you, living in you by the Spirit. But he said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Why? Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. You get that? In other words, if you know the mystery, you won't be wise in your own con uh, conceits. But if you don't know the mystery, if you don't know Christ in you, the hope of glory, if you don't know that it is by God's grace that He puts His Spirit within you, and, and how great a grace that is, that the very Spirit of the living God can dwell in what we would consider mortal men, that by that, God has agreed to live in us. What an honor that that would be. But he said, that I might have some fruit among you also. In other words, I want to come to you because I want some fruit for, among you. And we would look at that and go, well, Paul, that was pretty conceited right there. You want to come to us so you can have fruit? That is, it doesn't sound like you really love us. It just sounds like you want to have some fruit to, to present to God when you appear before him. And people say, well, you know, that he, he should have been operating by love and he should have been wanting to do it by love. And when I, when I hear statements like that, Paul wasn't really that kind of guy. You read his, his, uh, his messages, you read his life story, he was, he was a lot more like Lester Sumrall. Lester Sumrall, when you read about his life, when he first got saved, he said, I, ch I preach because God said, you preach or you die. He said, I wasn't preaching because I love people. I didn't care. He said, I was preaching to live. Now you would think, well, that doesn't sound like a good call to ministry. Yeah, well, he's still preaching, even though he's dead. Why? Because the fruit of his ministry. Over the years, what has come out of that. It was amazing. And in the early days, he, he would tell people, you need to get saved. And he went down one time to a, to a young lady and said, don't you want to get saved? And she said, no. He said, well, then go to hell. Tram walked off, and the lady passed out, fainted, fell over in the, in the aisle. And later on, whenever she came to, she was saved. And he said, oh, why, why, did you, why did you get saved? I, you know, I thought you didn't care. She said, well, I never had a preacher tell me to go to hell before. And he said, it just kind of shocked me. And that's why she passed out. <laughs> just literally fainted. And he said, well, there's only two places to go. And if you don't want to go to heaven, you're going to go to hell. He said, that's your choice. So I just told you, you know, you've made a choice. And, and, but whenever she came to, guess what? She was saved. Right? Now, see, today he would have been blasted for saying that. Before she ever woke up, they would have already run him out of town. Right? But the fruit of his ministry was a result of it. Now, so, then later, in, well, let me read the rest of verse 25 there. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Then in 1 Corinthians, again, Paul writing... Now, remember, you're still in the first century church. We're still here. We're, we're hearing bits and pieces of the letters that Paul wrote to these other churches that he said, you know what I've taught in all the churches, and I want you to preach it everywhere you go. That's what he told Timothy at one point. So we have to realize that whatever he said to one church, he was saying to all the believers everywhere. What's good for one is good for all. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 1, 
again, Paul says, now get the idea of how many times he says this. Again, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Now, you have to realize, Paul, even by secular standards, was highly educated. And yet, at one point, he said, you know what? I can't all that dung, which is a strong word to be used at that time. Very, it would be the equivalent to the word we don't say today in public. Or, you know, or at least around people that offend them or whatever else. But imagine that he writes to them. He said, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to brag? I can brag. You want to talk about pedigree? I got one. You want to talk about education? I've sat under the feet of the best. You want to talk about these things? You want to talk about who I am? Man, I, I can talk. You want to brag? Well, let's, let's brag. And he said, but you know what? All that stuff is dumb. None of that counts. He said, the only thing that counts is Christ Jesus and him crucified. He said, when I came to you, I purposed to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. Now think about that. So that was His consideration of secular learning. People say, well, yeah, but that was back then, and you know, even back then, our, our you know, second and third graders know more than they did la back then. No, you, you've been misled. They had knowledge back then. Okay, you explain how the Egyptians created mummies, because we still can't do it. They had knowledge back then, we didn't have today. And, Dr. Summerall said when he went to uh, England, one time he went to the Museum of Natural History and looked at Ur of the Chaldees, the collection that came from there where Abraham was from. And he said they actually had, in Ur of the Chaldees, when Abraham was there, they had hot and cold running water in their house. Think about that. And we didn't have it here till late 1800s, or early 1900s. Think about that. They had knowledge. They had a system of doing things, and they had knowledge that we didn't even have. So these people were not ignorant in the sense of, you know, backwoods, backward, whatever you want to call them. These people had, an, had, they had knowledge. And yet, it seemed like the knowledge went down over time, and now our knowledge is starting to increase a little bit in certain areas. But now he says, I would not have you that you should be ignorant, how that all of our fathers, now listen to this closely, because this is what he, he does not want them to be ignorant of this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now there's a couple of things to, to look at. Remember, we're in the first century church. I'm reading you bits and pieces of letters that we've gathered. We don't have them all, but we're gathering pieces. And that rock was Christ. You hear that? A rock followed them in the desert. Now again, I just read the Bible. I believe what it says. You look at it. It's amazing. A rock followed them in the desert. Now, automatically, now if you were at the end of the trail, you're not going to think you're getting very far. Because every time you look back, we're not going very far. That rock over there is still there. That rock's still there. Now think about that. Every time you look back, you travel all day long. You look at, at the end of the day, you look back, and there's that rock. Say, so are we going around in circles or what? The rock, we're not going anywhere. The rock, or imagine this. You're walking along, you look back, and you go. You see that rock? It's, it's following us. Now, you think you're not going to be thought crazy? You're going to like, what are you, crazy? Rock following us. I think you're right. There's a rock following us. Look at the trail. Because they would have to leave a trail. I mean, think about that. This thing followed them. And then later on, they find out, hey, guess what, we're going to get water from that rock. Is that right? You have to think, this isn't just stories, this stuff really happened. And now he says, and that rock was Christ. That was where all that life came from. He says but, in verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, now watch this. Now these things were our examples. Those things were our examples. To the intent. In other words, now he's going to say this is what the example was about. That we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, let what happened to them be an example to us that we should not have the same heart and mind that they had. He says, now watch, in verse 7, Neither be ye idolaters. 
Well, now, how many of you say, well, I want to be an idolater. That's, idolatry is what? That's my thing. I want to be an idolatry. Well, no Christian would ever say that. But now notice what he says. Now, because let's look at what he was talking about with idolatry. Let's look at their definition of idolatry. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. Now he's going to give the example of how they were idolaters, how they were in idolatry. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. <gasps> how awful. Do you see how we look at these things? You say, well, what's wrong with that? That's idolatry. <laughs> When you live to sit down and eat and drink and get up to go play, and it's all you live for, guess what? You're in idolatry. And that's the idolatry that caused them to be destroyed in the wilderness. And yet, okay, right there in your, in your Bible, you could put a little parentheses, or if you want to break up the chapter right there, you could just write, The American Dream. To be destroyed, and if you want to end up in idolatry. Boy, y'all getting real quiet in here. <laughs> is it real pleasing, is it? Now, should we prosper? Yeah, but why? It is God who gives you the power to create wealth so that He may establish His covenant on the earth. That's why you prosper. Not so you can live, not so you can keep up with the Joneses, or even worse, live better than the Joneses and let everybody else try to keep up with you. So, when I was reading this, I, I literally, it, you look at the state of the church, and that's the state of the church. You turn on, right now, if you were at home and you turned on television, you would hear that preached as the ultimate end of Christianity. Right now, you would be hearing that out of the mouths of preachers saying that's the ultimate end, is that, that you be blessed. That's why you're here, is so that God can bless you. Then verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Hear that? Over and over again, he tells us, Don't let us be idolaters like what they did. Why? They were an example to us to teach us the outcome of that. Don't let us commit fornication, Why? as some of them committed, and 23,000 of them died in one day. He said, let that be an example to you. Don't go that way. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Don't tempt. Verse 10, neither murmur. Now look at that. Murmuring is right there with committing fornication, with tempting Christ, and with idolatry. Hmm. Don't murmur. Don't complain. No whining. <laughs> Got it? No whining. No murmuring. No complaining. You say, well, how do you do? Fix it. If you can't fix it, shut up. Amen. Yeah? Do it or don't. You know? Either do something about it or don't do something about it. Either way, complaining doesn't do any good. Right? If you do it enough, I'm not going to stand next to you. Number one, I don't want to hear what you got to say. And number two, if the ground opens up to swallow you, I don't want to be standing next to you. <laughs> right? You say, well, God didn't do that anymore. According to some of you, you can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants anytime he wants. Right? That's called sovereignty, according to some people. So, you know, and even if the ground isn't going to open up, I still don't want to stand next to you because I don't want to hear it. Why? Got better things to keep my mind on. I can think on things that are lovely and pure and of good report. Not on your murmuring and complaining. You want to murmur and complain? I can murmur and complain better than you can. I could go into more things because not only do, do I have the same kind of problems you do, I got your problems to listen to too. <laughs> you get that? All right, so. You start complaining, and I can add anybody else's complaints to it, too. I can say, yeah, you know what so-and-so told me? They got this, too. And we go down a whole list. Their list will be longer than your list. Why? Because you got everybody's. Right? So we can all come together and complain, but nothing good's going to come out of that. No, nothing's going to change unless you change it. Right? As they always say, be the change that you want to see in the world. I think it was Gandhi said it first. Then Michael Jackson picked it up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Wide spectrum. But... 
You have to be that change. You have to decide to do something about it. Not say, anybody can complain. But the valuable people are the ones that fix it. Do something about it. You want the world to change? Change it. <clears throat> Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. People say, you believe it's the end of the world? Yeah, apparently. Paul said it was 2,000 years ago. Right? The last days, the end of the world. There you go. And Paul's still writing to the Corinthians. Same letter in, verse, in uh, chapter 12. And we know this one. We've talked about it before. Remember, we're back in the 80 AD, back in the first century. Got groups of uh, just things that were pulling together. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. God doesn't want you ignorant of spiritual gifts. He doesn't want you ignorant of the mystery, right? He doesn't want you ignorant of the, the examples that we have. All these things so far, every one of these passages has to do with you not being ignorant of certain things. He said, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Watch this. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now, it's amazing out of this one verse, what, it, what, what comes out of that when you look at it. He said, you know that you were Gentiles. He said, I don't want you ignorant about spiritual gifts, but you know that you were Gentiles. You were cut off from God. You had nothing to do with God, didn't know God. And while you didn't know God, you were led away unto dumb idols. You used to, you were religious. And you'd go to these dumb idols and you'd bow down in front of them and you'd take your offering and you'd take food and things and you'd take and you'd sacrifice to these things. You'd bow down before them and you'd pray to these wood statues that a man somewhere carved. And you're bowing down before it. And so he said, and you were, you were carried away into these dumb idols and you thought these things were gods. And then he says, even as you were led. Now get that. In other words, you could be religious and be led, not of God, but because you were religious and not born again, didn't have the Spirit of God in you, you were following other gods, and you would bow down to these other idols, and you were led of a spirit. What spirit? The spirit of your father at that time, which was the devil. The devil led you to do things, especially when you were religious and before you got born again. And I can tell you right now, a large part of the Christian church is that right now. A large part of the Christian church is not even born again. They are just very religious. And because of that, they are led by another spirit. And it is a spirit of religion. And it, does, it sounds very uh, holy. It sounds very spiritual among, to most people. But it is religion. And they're not even born again. And, and it's amazing because those are mainly the ones that you end up, if you're on Facebook or something, you end up fighting with them. You know? and, and the funny thing is, they, they, they think they're free. And they don't realize that they're being led by another spirit into a false religion that is so far from the heart and spirit of God that when God shows up, they won't even recognize Him. Just like the Jews didn't recognize Jesus when He showed up. So He's going to show up and they're not going to get it. And so you can be religious and be led of a false spirit, of a bad spirit if you want to call it that. And, and yet, people, he, Jesus said that very thing. He said, there's going to come a time when they're going to pull you out and they're going to kill you. They're going to bring you before magistrates and they're going to kill you. And they're going to think that they're doing God a service. And they don't realize what God they're really doing a service to. The key thing, and I, I'll get to this a little bit later on, but the key thing is that you always have to maintain an examination of yourself to see whether you be in the faith. And people say, well, I, I'm in, so I, I, I'm good. No, that's not what Paul said. Even the tense there has to go back to be examining yourself to see if you be or are remaining in the faith. Now, let's go on. He says in 2 Corinthians. Now, this is, as we know, the first letter. You know, again, we're in the 80 AD, early church. Paul's already written one letter to the Corinthians. We don't know anything about that. That just totally bypassed us. Whenever Paul sent that letter, it, it didn't come by this way. But now whenever he sent a second letter, now we call that the first letter because that's the first Corinthians we've ever seen. With the first letter to the Corinthians we've ever seen, we call it first Corinthians, but in reality that was the second letter written. 
And then later on, we have the third letter written, which we now call 2 Corinthians. So I know that sounds kind of confusing, but, you know, bottom line, that's what happened. So when Paul writes the second letter to Corinthians, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we know that Satan can get an advantage of us. Unless we do something, right? For we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, guess what? If you are ignorant of his devices, he will get an advantage. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and telling them, you know, I'm telling you these things so that Satan will not get an advantage because we're not ignorant of his devices. We know how he works. Just a couple of weeks ago, we did the, the SWAT training, the spiritual warfare training. And in it, we go into some of his devices, some of his ways of trying to, to fool you and deceive you. But we know for a fact that that's his job. That's what he does best. That's his forte, you might say, is to try to deceive people. And so here Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want to make sure that you know what Satan's devices are. And I don't because I don't want him to get an advantage over you. Now think about that. What that tells us is that we always have to be vigilant. We always have to be watchful. I'm not talking about paranoia. I'm not talking about in fear. I'm just saying be aware. Just be aware of what's going on. Be aware that the that you have an enemy. That's the biggest thing that the church is missing today. Most of the church doesn't even recognize that there is a war going on. Most of them think that, well, you know, the, the war is over. It's not over. It's won, but it's not over. So there's a big difference. The war is not over. We're in the middle of it right now. And that war is spiritual warfare, and it is Satan trying to get an advantage over us. 1 Thessalonians. Now Paul writes to the Thessalonians. In chapter 4, verse 13, he tells them, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. About what? Well, concerning them which are asleep. Why? Because Paul, in the, in the uh, church at Thessalonica, people had come around and said, oh, you know, the resurrection, all that's already happened, it's already passed, it's already done. And people were getting upset over it, and they're thinking, oh, we've missed it, we've, we've done this, what's going on? And Paul says, listen, I, brethren, don't be ignorant about them which sleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, don't worry about it. It's not passed. You've still got a hope. There is still the hope of his returning. It's not done with. And Paul is writing to them and he said, I don't want you to be ignorant about this thing. And yet we still have, even in the world today, 2,000 years later, we have denominations, we have cults that have built most of their foundation on the fact that all of this is already passed. And that Jesus, you know, showed up spiritually at certain times. Then Peter writes, He's already written one letter, now he's writing a second one. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, he says, But beloved, now Peter's warning them, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You hear what he's telling them? Don't be ignorant of this one thing. Know this. And what's, Now he, he kind of condensed what he's saying here to that one Scripture, one verse. But then the purpose of that one verse is very simple. It's verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. He said, listen, God doesn't count time the way we do. But don't give up. Don't quit. Why? Now, if anybody was quick to quit and quit, you know, quick to do anything, it was Peter. He was always quick to jump in and quick to jump out. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. He said, see, look, you think God is not going to do what He said He's going to do. It's not that God is not going to do it. It's that God is long-suffering. He's waiting to make sure that everything's right. Because if He does it according to your time schedule, guess what? There's going to be people left out. There's going to be people that are not in. Maybe even you yourself won't be right. So He is not slack in His promise. He will do what He said He's going to do, but He is long-suffering. He's giving you time to change. Think about that. He is long-suffering to us, or toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You have to remember, many times they were praying, it, as many, maybe you have prayed, Oh God, let today be the day. Let it be over. I'm done. I'm right with you. Come on. Let, let's just get out of here. And he says, you know, I, I would, but, but that is so selfish, because your neighbor doesn't know yet. 
Your neighbor doesn't know to accept me and he doesn't know to reject me. He just doesn't know. So instead of you thinking about you getting out of here, thinking about going, think about the long suffering and think I'm giving you time to win your family, to win your loved ones, to win your neighbors. Get your mind off of you and quit thinking selfishness and thinking, oh, I can't stand anymore, take me out of this. No, think in terms of there are people that need God. He said, that not only that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, in other words, seeing that this is going to happen, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy lifestyle, conversation, and godliness? Hear that? In other words, this is, listen, he said he's, he's holding off. He's not coming because it's not a matter of that he's forgotten his promise. He knows his promise and he's holding back. He would rather be here now, but if he comes now, then are you going to be ready? He said, but knowing that this stuff is going to happen, knowing this is going to pass away, knowing all is going to burn, all that stuff, knowing all that, what manner of people should we be? Should we be living holy lives before God? Should our, our, when it says conversation, it means not just what you say, but your entire lifestyle. Your entire lifestyle should be that. He says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Now some would tell you, oh well that's already been all done for you so you ain't got to worry about it. Well in the spirit, guess what? That's true. You've been recreated, your spirit is blameless, but guess what? He tells us to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness and superfluity of the flesh. And he talked about and in the spirit. So your spirit's been made right, but your soul can so taint everything else that it completely messes you up. And he says, listen, live godly, holy lives. Live right. Be holy. Be, be blameless. Without spot. That's why he's, he says, that's how we should live. Knowing what's coming, we should live this way. Expecting and knowing that the only reason it, reason it hadn't already happened is because he is long-suffering. Because if it came yesterday, don't raise your hand, but how many of you would have missed it? You say, well, but you're talking to believers. Am I? I hope so, but I don't know. Why? Because I'm not judging you. I don't know what your heart is, and, and I don't know. Even if I talk to you, I don't know. Because most people nowadays that come to church know how to give the right religious answer. And they can fool people, but they can't fool the Spirit. And many times you get that little, eh. it's like, something ain't right. But inside now, that doesn't mean you go, yeah, something's not right with you. No. If anything, you pray. God, if there's something there, help them. Bless them. Whatever it is, let, let their eyes be opened. But there has to be that part. Just because people say they're a Christian doesn't mean they are. He said, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, now Peter is referring to Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, talking about holy living predominantly, in which are some things hard to be understood. Which, now listen to this, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle with, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You hear that? People in the church, that's who read his letters, wasn't the people outside the church. The, the letters were written to people in the church. And he said, these people, they don't get it and they don't understand it and they're not living these kind of lives and, are, and God has not changed their heart to that point. But now notice, he says, and because of that, you... He says right there that these people will take these things and they're unlearned, they don't understand, and because of that, they wrestle with the scriptures to their own destruction, and it ends up taking them away from God. Now, I know, and again, this is kind of like your, your 
in this first century church, and every now and then I give you kind of a, a commercial break. But I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to remind you of something. Okay? And that commercial break is very simple that you have to realize where he says here, under their own destruction, again, we have to be aware of our own condition. Right? It's not a matter of just being religious. Well, I, I have relatives right now that, that I've talked to about, about the Lord before. And it's funny because their answer is, oh, well, you know, if I, I, really all i got to do is quit drinking and smoking. And, and, and I'll be right then. And I told them, I said, I, I've told them before, that doesn't make you right. Quit, quit drinking doesn't make you right. Quit smoking doesn't make you right with God. You know, it, make, it does show you have a little more intelligence. Why? Because those two things will kill you. But that's all. There's people has nothing to do with God that quit drinking and quit smoking. Right? So it has nothing to do with you being right with God or not. Right with, and, and what I always try to tell them is, it's not what you get rid of that makes you right with God. It's that you get right with God and then watch what you start getting rid of. Why? Because things start falling away. Paul tells us, let us lay aside the sin and the weight which so easily besets us. So he tells us, it's the change of heart that counts. It's not the outside. It's not, well, you know, I want to quit smoking so I'll fit in with the group. No, you can fit in with the group here and yet still miss heaven. You understand what I mean by that? Miss God. So there has to be that change. You, you can't partake of the, the, the table of the world and the table of God. You can't do it. You, you can't do unrighteousness and be righteous. You can't do it. It is impossible. Now, I know I'm making people, if people watch on the internet, there's people out there I'm making mad right now. There's people probably, you know, if we watch the numbers on our internet, it's probably dropping. Why? And I don't care. You know, honestly, if all of you got up and said, I, I'm, I'm not listening, it's all going. And guess what? I'd turn around to my own family and say, y'all going to leave too? Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Why? Because you preach truth. Whether people like it or not, whether it hurts your income or anything else, you preach truth. You know, if I, if, if I couldn't make a living doing what I'm doing, guess what? I'd go back to doing another type of job, and I'd still keep preaching. I'd still keep praying for people. And in many ways, it'd be much easier. Many ways. Because then I wouldn't be responsible to be available to go everywhere that I go. But I have to preach the truth. And I have to. And, and it's very clear. If I don't warn you, if I don't warn people that need warning, and I'm not saying anybody in this room needs warning. But if there's one person here that needs warning, and I don't warn you, your blood's on my hands. So I will warn you. And what I will tell you is examine yourselves. Now I'm not going to come look over your shoulder, look in your backyard and tell you what you ought to clean up. I will tell you, get before God. Get right with God. Get, get before Him and tell Him, search me. Anything that's not of you, tell me. I'll remove it or you remove it. Either way, it's got to be gone. Now, mostly you got to do it. That's, that's why most people don't do it. Now, I'll show you that in just a minute. But he said that they wrestle these things to their own destruction. Peter's still talking, verse 17. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware. Now, now think about that. Now, if there's no danger, why do you need to beware? You know, if it's all, if it's, if it's just done and there's nothing for you, you have nothing to do with it, why do you need to beware? But he said, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. All right? Now, listen, I'm not here today trying to tell you what all these verses mean. I'm just making sure you hear them. You decide what they mean. You go back in. You study it. You know? And don't write me letters or emails you know, complaining. I had one I'm going to mention a little bit later on. I don't have time to talk about it now. But they were asking me, well, you sound like you, like you believe you can lose your salvation. And like I said, I don't, I don't have time to get into it now. I will do a teaching on that in the future. But I'll tell you this. I, I will tell you this much right now. God did not save me against my will. And I really can't imagine him keeping me against my will. If I set my will to depart from him, I doubt if he would stop me. Amen. He didn't stop Adam. Right? It's just that simple. Now, people say, I had one person that was at our media house, and they were living there with the guys, and, and they said, you know, uh, Craig, what do you think about one saved, always saved? I said, I don't want out. I, I don't think about it at all. I don't want out. Right? I know what the other life was like, and I don't want that. 
But Jesus said, if you don't hate your life, I'm going to, at one point here in the near future, I'm going to be doing a complete teaching on what it means to be a disciple. Because the very first thing Jesus said about being a disciple, most people don't agree with. He said, except you hate your life, except you hate everything about your life, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you forsake everything, you cannot be my disciple. Those two things right there just knocked out probably 90% of the average quote-unquote nominal Christian today. Because they come into Christianity thinking, uh, my life isn't that bad, could be a lot better, and according to most Christian teaching I hear, if I come to Jesus, he'll fix the broken places and my life will be perfect. And Jesus never said your life is going to be perfect. He said if you're going to, even Paul, he, he spoke to Paul on point and said, if you're going to live godly in Christ, you will suffer persecution. You will have tribulation. He said, but don't worry about that. I've overcome the tribulation. I've overcome the world. And because your faith is in me, you can overcome too. But we are commanded to overcome. He didn't say you've already overcome. You are commanded to overcome. He said to him that overcometh. So, now, he goes on here. 2 Corinthians. Now we're back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. Verse 13, he says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Whether, and what he's saying there, now when he says sober there, he's not talking about not being drunk, you know, with alcohol. He's not talking that at all. Usually when he talked about sober-minded, it had very little to do with, you know, alcohol or anything like that. He was saying, listen, think clear. You know, use your brain, use it correctly, be sanctified, right? Have your mind renewed. And here he said, if we're, if we're beside ourselves, if we're, if we're crazy, guess what? We're crazy to God. But if we're sober, it's for your benefit. If we're thinking sane, and actually the word there for sober is for your studies, number 4993 in the Strong's Concordance. It is the Greek word sophroneo, and it means to, be, to have a sound mind, to be sane and moderate. Not, not extreme, moderate. But to be, have a sound mind, to be sane. First Thessalonians, again, Paul writing to the Thessalonian church in verse 5, or chapter 5. And I remember we're in that first century church. We're getting these pieces together and we're starting to put these things together. He's, and Paul says, But of the times and, and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Now notice who it comes upon? The ones yelling peace and safety. Right? Now just as a, to throw this in here real quick, Benjamin Franklin said that the person who would trade freedom for security deserves neither. He says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Hear that? It's not supposed to take overtake you as a thief. Why? Because a thief comes when no one's expecting. A thief comes when no one's prepared. He's saying, Be prepared, brethren. You don't, you're not like them. You're not in the dark. Your eyes are wide open. You know what's coming. If it, take, if it overtakes you, you shouldn't be surprised. You ought to be going, yeah, I, I was waiting for you. It shouldn't, it shouldn't come upon you. It shouldn't take you by surprise. Why? Because you're not in the dark. He said, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, because we're not in the darkness, because we're, we're children of light, let us... Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. He's not talking about, don't, don't go to sleep, stay up all night and watch. He's not talking about that. He's saying, don't be slumber-minded. As we would say, don't put your head in the sand. Right? He said, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And that word sober is actually different than the other one. It's a number 3525 in Strong's Concordance. And it means literally to abstain or to be disciplined. Hmm, imagine that. Discipline. Well, why do you need discipline? It's all done. Nothing matters. See, you need discipline because that shows the same mind. You need discipline because it shows that you are expecting that day. 
He says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, now notice how he's contrasting that, and saying, Let us not be like those who sleep in the night and are drunk in the night. Let us who are of the day be sober. And that word there is number 35, 25, same word as in the verse above it. It means to be sober, it means to be to abstain and be disciplined. But let us who are of the day be disciplined putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. You hear that? Now, why would believers put on the hope of salvation? If you got it, you got it. But see, there is still a hope in the sense that you've not endured. You still must endure. It's not a matter of it's done. You must still endure. Now, this is what Finney, and if you go back and read Finney's work, he called this the perseverance of the saints. You believe, and it's like breathing. You didn't breathe once. You say, well, I breathe, so I'm good. No, you'll be dead. No, you breathe, and as long as you breathe, you are breathing. You're alive. Okay, when you had faith in Christ, your faith in Christ must continue on, and that faith must be lived out and proven by your life, by your works even. That's what James said. Now, see, everybody loves Paul, and they forget James. And James is Scripture too. He said, you say you've got faith, you know, you, you, you say you got it, fine. Let me show, I show you my faith by my works. Now listen, you can have works without faith, but you can't have faith without works. Right? Now you don't get saved by works. You get saved by faith. And because you're saved, you work. Why? Because to him that is forgiven much, there is much love. You want to do the things for God. He says, now there's again, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. No, you've not been appointed to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have to move on here kind of quick, I guess. Paul again wrote to 1 Timothy, or wrote to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, this is a true saying. Then we're going to start tying all this together. You know, it's kind of one of those things that you, you start up the hill, and then as you go over, you start gaining speed, and we're going to put it all together before we get done here. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Notice it doesn't say if, if he wasn't called to it, he shouldn't be desiring it. It says you can desire it. And if you desire it, you desire a good work. Nothing wrong with desiring it. Nothing wrong with applying yourself toward it. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife... Vigilant, sober. There's that word sober again. Now, the word sober there is number 4998 in Strong's. And it means safe. It means self controlled. And it means moderate. You hear that? A bishop must be safe, self controlled, and moderate. Of good behavior. Given to hospitality. Apt to teach. Not given to wine. No striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler. Not covetous. Why? Because covetous is idolatry. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Get that? Children in subjection with all gravity. In other words, they should be sober-minded too. They should pick up from their father that things are serious, things are right. Not that you can't have a good time, not, but that you know what counts, what is important. And what, what's important is anything that can pass away isn't important. That Those are temporal. What's eternal is what's important. He says, one that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, being, less being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, or outside the church, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, serious, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave. You get that? The wives must be grave. The same requirement for the leader, for the pastor, for the deacon, for, is also the requirement for the wife. <clears throat> Not slanderers. Sober. 
Now that word sober is number 3524. It's a different word. See, that's what I don't like about the King James is they, they would use the same English word for all these different Greek words. And you just read it, think it always means the same thing, and you have to go in and study it to find out it doesn't. What it means here is to be circumspect, to be vigilant, to be aware. Faithful in all things. Then in Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For this cause, Paul writing to, to Titus, says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, and that's number 4998, that means safe, self-controlled, and moderate. Just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now listen to this. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision or those of the law, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of them, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Now watch. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Didn't say be kind, overlook it, and love them in. Doesn't say that at all. It says rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, now listen to this, verse 16. You might want to underline this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Hear that? They profess they know God, but in works they deny Him. And in every good work here, he says, that they are reprobate. Titus 2, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. That's that word circumspect or vigilant. Be sober, grave or serious, temperate. Sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they would be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober. And that word sober means to have a sound mind or to be disciplined. The older women are, teach the, are to teach the younger women be disciplined. Have a sound mind. To love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands. Notice it says to their own husbands, not everybody else's husband. Yeah. Right? Now, the reason I say this is because when we started our Bible school back in Denver, we actually had two husbands get up in class, go out on the front porch, and square off with one another, fixing to fight. Welcome to Bible school. Literally. Because one had cornered the other one's wife and was really getting on to her. And the other one said, you don't talk to my wife that way. If you got a problem, you come to me, which is correct. And, but now the way they handled it wasn't because they both, <laughs> and I'm up there teaching. And I see them leave and go out on the front. And then they're getting loud out there. And, they're, and they, they literally, they squared off and were fixing to go at it. <laughs> In Bible school. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I did not think I was as naive as I have been. <laughs> okay. It's amazing. He says that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Tell the young men, be sober-minded. Be, be disciplined. In all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. Again, oh, a pattern of good works. So you should be doing good works. Things that people can see. What is that? That's letting your light shine. So to glorify your Father in heaven, they can see your good works. Right? Now, 
If we need to change something over, Halsey, go ahead and do it. I'm going to take a drink. This is called buying time. Okay? Hang on a second. We're still doing good here. Okay, that's about as much time as I can buy. <laughs> if they were singing, we could just take a moment and sing with them, but they're not. So He says, verse 7, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Now, these are supposed to be things that you look at doctrine and say, is that doctrine, is, it, is there a soberness about it? Is it serious? Is it... Is it Sound-minded. In other words, is it not giving way to just loose living? Does it tighten things up? Now, now I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about you living the disciplined life before God. Sound speech, or sincerity there, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And this is the reason I read this far. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So the grace of God teaches us something. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, if you hear a grace teaching that does not teach you to deny ungodliness, to deny, if, if, if the grace teaching does not teach you to deny worldly lust, if the grace teaching that, that you hear does not teach you to live soberly, to live righteously to, and godly in this present world, it's not the grace of the Bible. Right. It is a, a, a false grace, and I'm telling you, it's giving people a false security. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. Now that's what I'm doing today, right? Overall, and we're getting to that. Titus chapter 3 says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and to obey magistrates, to be ready to do every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. Now notice he's comparing those people at that time that were teaching the same things being taught today in many places. And he's comparing them to being foolish, disobedient, deceived, saying we were just like them at one time, serving divers various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And I, I tell you what, you, you cross a person that has taken the grace message too far, and let me tell you, hate and bitterness comes out real quick. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward men, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that you will affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are, are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And see, that's not, not what you hear. It's what you hear from <laughs> this pulpit, but you don't hear it out there. Well, you're basically told, don't worry about it, nothing matters anymore. What used to be sin, that ain't sin no more, because there is no sin anymore. That's what you hear many times. And I'm telling you, that's a lie. If it was ever sin, it's still sin. If it was for sin, if it was sin for you whenever you were unsaved, it's sin for you today now that you claim to be saved. 
Titus 3.14 says, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not fruitful. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. In other words, abstain. Have some discipline. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You hear that? That's talking about you receiving grace later when Jesus Christ appears. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of lifestyle. Now the King James says conversation, but it means everything. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain lifestyle, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Then in verse in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. In 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 8, he says, Be sober. There it is again. Notice how many times he said, don't be ignorant, be sober. Be sober-minded, be clear-headed, think clearly, think accurately. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He didn't say you ain't got to worry about him. He says you've got an enemy out there. Be vigilant, be sober-minded, be clear-headed. Don't let him deceive you. He's not going to walk up to you and, and try to get you to say, well, I deny Christ. Well, he's not going to do that. He's going to try to get you off. He's going to try to say, oh, yeah, I believe in Christ, but just live like the world. Seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the in the world. But the grace of God, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to try to hurry here. I think we're just, yeah, we're about done. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. But now notice the main part here is that it says that the Spirit speaks expressly that in the last latter times some shall depart from the faith. And that right there tells you it's possible to depart from the faith. If you couldn't depart, he wouldn't warn and he wouldn't say that the Spirit is warning the church saying in the last days there's going to be a departure from the faith. For every creature of God is good, verse 4, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren, notice if, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, what things? That the Spirit speaketh expressly, that people are going to depart the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. All right, you get that? Today I have fulfilled the responsibilities of being a good minister of Jesus Christ. You get that? Why? Because I'm reminding you, I'm putting in your remembrance that in the last days, the Spirit of God speaks very clearly and expressly that people can depart the faith and can go to seducing spirits and deceit and all these other things and depart the faith. A good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, 
and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise your youth. Now see, that's a scripture I don't have to claim anymore. For years I had to claim that scripture. But I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm not a youth anymore, so I, can, I passed that one. I made it past that. But in the early days, many despised my youth and thought I didn't know anything because I was too young to know it. Right? I don't have to worry about that now. I'm getting some gray, and people actually think I know something now. They'll actually stop long enough to listen and give me a chance to share what God gave me 30 years ago. Let no man despise your youth, but be you an example of the believers in word, in life. Now, obviously, conversation doesn't mean word, because he just said word, so he's not talking about speech. He's talking about lifestyle. In word, in lifestyle, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We're to be examples of these things. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Read what? The, the scriptures, of the letters he's written. To exhortation and to doctrine. Give attendance to doctrine. Doctrine is important. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of presbytery. Meditate upon these things. In other words, don't just come here and listen to them once. Meditate on them. Think about them. Let this be what you think about during the day. Give yourself wholly. Completely, we would say, to them. That your profiting may appear to all. Now, your growth. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will both save yourself and them that hear thee. Hear that? If you continue in this, you'll save yourself. Well, he was talking to Timothy. Timothy was already saved. But he's saying there's a continuance. There's a perseverance that you have to maintain. And them that hear you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We all know this one. Study, be diligent, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, not a student, a workman, somebody that's doing something, that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrown the faith of some. He's saying these guys, they've erred. They've gone off and they've even made other people lose their faith. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now you can't get any plainer than that. But in a, now watch this. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself, it does not say if God purges a man. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. So if you're not a vessel unto honor, whose fault is it? It's ours. It's your own fault. Sanctified. Oh, now look at there. So sanctification has something to do with what you do. And meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. There's that word good works again. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And we're running one last time here back to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first... Now, listen carefully to this. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Hear that? If the righteous scarcely, barely, is saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. 
prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate? You can't, you can't be reprobate if you can't fall away from the faith. Because reprobate means to be in something and then to be out of it. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. In other words, that's the way people think about us. Now, this is where we get to that part. Again, I don't have time to get into this. I'm about done here. But I will. What I had a letter. I get letters and emails and stuff, so I'm going to answer this one because it kind of called and come into play here. It says, Dear Brother Curry, can you please explain this scripture? Revela and then I get the scripture. Revelation chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And it says, He that overcometh, this is the scripture, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now they went on and said, I heard a preacher recently say that this proves that a saved person can lose their salvation. What do you think? Well, as I said, I don't have time to get into that today per se, but I think the scripture, again, I, I didn't, today mostly I was reading scripture to you and hopefully, you, it's not my comments, it's what the scriptures plainly say. But as I said before, I don't have time to answer it, but... When people ask me about when saved, always saved, number one, I always tell them I don't want out. But number two, I always tell them that if I, I guess if I wanted out, God would let me out. Now, I'm not saying if you just go, you know, throw a temper tantrum and, you know, I'm not saying that. Or I'm not saying this sin or one sin or that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about if God wouldn't save me against my will, then I don't know why he would keep me against my will. But that means you have to set your will to go against God, right? And, and I, I, the, as far as I'm going to say is this. It's not that I believe that you can lose your salvation just so easily. It's that I tend to believe that most people that just think they're saved aren't. In other words, I think it may be a little more to getting it than most people just think, right? And, and, but now, Jesus said very clearly, you've got wheat and you've got tares. Let them grow together, and you don't pick them out and throw out the tares because you might hurt the wheat. You let it all grow together, and by its works, you'll see what each is. And that's all we do. Now, I will tell you this. God has nothing to do with death, destruction, fear, any of that. In anything you do that has something to do with that, God does not, not have a part of it. Right? God has nothing to do let me tell you, right now what the enemy is really trying to do, in the, not just in the church, but in the world, he is trying to build a fear in the world. And especially, here I'm saying this just before Halloween, of course, and, which is, you know, fear day of the year, basically, for most people. And right now you walk into any store, any Walmart or, you know, anywhere, and all, they got all their horror movies. That's what's on display. Why? Because this is the big time of the year when they sell them. And I'm telling you, two things. Number one, you buy into that stuff, you'll get a spirit of fear. It is that simple. You cannot watch horror movies and not get a spirit of fear. Amen. You cannot do it. Number two, it has nothing to do with the spirit of God. Amen. Right? Freddy Krueger ain't got nothing to do with God. You get that? His whole purpose is to get you to jump. And most of the time, the best way that I can tell if a person has a spirit of fear... I walk up behind you and scare you. Basically, you just walk behind you and go, hey, how's it going? And, and if, you know, a lot of times if you jump real uh, Now, there's a difference of being startled because you're not expecting it. Now, I understand. I understand that. There's a difference. You startle somebody and generally, you know, unless they're heavily medicated, they'll jump. All right? Sometimes they're so heavily medicated, they're like, yeah. But, but what I'm saying is you, a person with a spirit of fear is jumpy. They're always, they're always nervous because there is that fear there. And you say something, and their reaction will be much greater than just a person who just kind of jumps. And so the, you don't want to feed that. You want to feed faith. You want to, listen, bravery and fear have nothing to do with each other. Yes. And, and faith is just courage. That's what it comes to. It is spiritual courage. And you cannot 
watch stuff that feeds upon... See, whenever you watch a movie, you put yourself into one of the places, one of the people, one of the roles. Automatically, you do it. And if you're not, and now, number one, if you're putting yourself in the person that's carrying the chainsaw, there's, you've got a much deeper problem we need to talk about. <laughs> okay? Now, on the other hand, if you're the person that the person with the chainsaw is chasing, and you identify with that person, then you've got a problem, because I guarantee you've got a spirit of fear. There's no way you can watch it without getting it. There's, it's impossible. And when you try to minister to people, 90% of your effectiveness is gone. Why? Because you're 90% fear. And it will overflow into every other thing. So in this time of the year, you know, we have to bring these things out. We are a people of faith, not of fear. Amen? Amen. So in all of this, this is where we need to start moving toward. In our life, in our conversation, in everything, we always need to be full of faith. There are things that are going on in this world right now that you can look at it through two eyes. You can look at it through one that of, of fear. And it says that many people's hearts will fail them for fear of what is coming upon them. Or you can look at it through the eyes of faith and say, this is going to be our greatest day. Why? Because our light is going to, the darker it gets, the brighter our light will be. So you can look at it through the eye of fear or the eye of faith. Now, and you can talk both. But when it comes down to it, if you talk faith and fear, guess what? Fear will, will take place whenever it comes down to it. Fear will rise because you're feeding into the carnal. But if you talk faith, you live faith, you believe faith, you can still know what's coming and you can be prepared. I told my family that I said, you know, to a prepared person, a prepared person never experiences an emergency. Why? Because they're prepared. Right? Then it's like my daughter said the other day, she said, you know, Paul got bit by a snake. God didn't say the snake wouldn't bite you. Right? Sometimes you get bit by the snake. Guess what? You shake it off and you go on. Amen. And when the people see how you shake it off, it builds their faith. Right? So sometimes it's not what you avoid, it's what you go through and how you go through it that helps other people's faith. So, all right. Let's all stand up. Now, as I told you before, I am packing and loading, getting ready to go on the trip, so we have to leave fairly quick after this. But I do want to uh, pray for you. Oh, yeah, we got to... I always forget. We do the offering. <laughs> If they didn't wave the basket at me, I wouldn't even have time to think about it. So, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to pray with the offering. We're going to take care of all this stuff. And then we're going to dismiss you. If you need prayer, we'll be here to help you. I myself can probably pray for a couple. Can't stay too long. But then I can also, uh, Kevin and them are here. There are others that are here that can pray. Right? Please, do not get into idolatry. I'm not the only person that can pray. Amen. All right? God lives in every believer in here. And he can work through anybody here that will let him. So, Father, I thank you right now for these people. I thank you, Father, that your word has come forth as your spirit has desired. That it will also have the desired effect. That it will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose to which you sent it. So, Father, I thank you right now that your word has settled into and abides in the hearts and the minds of these people who are under the sound of my voice right now, who are your people. And Father, I thank you that they do examine themselves, that they do prove themselves. Father, I thank you right now that your spirit gives witness to us that we are your children. And that right now, by the spirit of God, we release life. We release health. Right now, in the name of Jesus, if you've never received the baptism of the spirit, right now, that is your heritage to tell God you want it. And if you ask him, he will give it to you. So it's that simple. Right now, in the name of Jesus, just receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence and the fullness of speaking in other tongues and allowing the Spirit to work through you in that way. So, Father, I thank you right now. There are those under the sound of my voice that were religious, not saved. But through this preaching, they have discovered that they were not right with you. They were religious. They had uh, different works and things. But right now, they are choosing in their heart to say, Jesus, I make you my Lord. Not just Savior, Lord and Savior. And as they do that, right now, their hearts are made new. Their, their spirits are recreated. They are born again. Even now. And right now, by the Spirit of God, we release life and health and strength. We command sickness and disease. Go! 
in Jesus' name. You leave these people and never return. Every problem, every ailment must go now in Jesus' name. Right now, complete fullness of life in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you even for these finances that are being received that we, right now, we bless those that, that are able to give and to those that desire to give but even can't. We say right now, let your blessing flow upon them that they can also be able to give as they would desire. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name, we receive these to work in your kingdom, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless y'all. We're going to go ahead and yeah, pass the basket around there. Now, we will be available to minister to you. Uh, we are going to be loading kind of at the same time. So, we appreciate you coming. Um, other than that, now if you do want other information on being a member of the church, there's some paper behind the seats there. You can actually fill that out and turn those in. Otherwise, we will see you all next week, and we will have more time, or actually, I guess a week from Sunday, we'll have more time to fellowship together. And, uh, you know, hate these trips where I have to run, but it's what it requires at this point. But we will be back in town as quick as we can, and um, we're going to try to make it back here before Election Day so that we can cast our vote also. Amen? So, all right, God bless you all. We'll see you.